Hello and welcome to ATP Report. It's the Katie and Barry Show. Joining me from beautiful London, England this evening is Katie Hopkins. Hello, Katie. <laughs> Hi, Barry. I'm not so sure about beautiful, but it is very twinkly. Lots of Christmas lights out and about. Well, at least they haven't banned that yet. Let's talk about some other weird stuff in the UK, though, uh, which is what's going on with the first people to get the vaunted and highly celebrated COVID-19 vaccine. I understand you've got a couple of old people, uh, 90-year-old <laughs> Margaret and some William Shakespeare character. The name sounds familiar. Uh, what's happened with the first vaccines? Yeah, so the UK have basically rushed ahead and kind of got this vaccine and kind of thrown it out the door, whether it's ready or not. Uh, of course, we have the staged images of a 90-year-old being wheeled in to get her vaccine. And she said, quote, it's the best day of my life. Now, if the best day of your life and you've reached the age of 90 is getting a vaccine, I'm going to say your life hasn't been as exciting as it might have been. The second thing is the other guy they shoved the vaccine in was called William Shakespeare. And I just have some concerns. Like, I don't want to be a fear but if we kill off or if Pfizer kills off William Shakespeare, that's not going to be a good look. But so they've thrown this vaccine out at people, but there was the headlines that followed shortly after that said two nurses that took it. So two nurses in the NHS had a severe allergic reaction and they had to use those EpiPens. And so then came the headline, don't use the vaccine if you've got allergies. So already we're seeing some not so great side effects. Now, I'm not trying to be the doom monger. People want to take this thing, take it. I think all I'm trying to say and advocate for is choice. So I'm concerned that we're going to get to the point in the UK where we don't have a choice about whether we take this thing or not. Well, before we get to that, wasn't there a case of like a facial paralysis or a palsy in a number yeah. of people in the first trial group as well? Absolutely. So that trial, you're quite right, had two groups, obviously, the vaccine group and the placebo group, placebo group, sorry. In the vaccine group, there were two deaths, which is alarming. But in the placebo group, there were four deaths. So, OK. But in the, in the vaccine group, there were four instances of facial paralysis, Bell's palsy, as it's called, and none in the placebo group. So that's alarming. And there is a history of vaccines for flu causing facial paralysis. There were also instances of appendicitis and also instances of heart attacks and strokes. So not only have there been some, you know, instances that don't look too favorable for the vaccine, I suppose the question is, why is it being rolled out so quickly if there are things like these allergies that haven't been identified? And I have been overwhelmed, Barry, uh, with emails from doctors, nurses, ambulance people telling me they won't be having this. They know I'm speaking out. Uh, they are grateful they have a voice and they are telling me I'm not taking this thing. I will leave the health service before I take it. Well, I, you know, years ago, I had a doctor um, that was treating my family have me read out loud the disclosure in the flu vaccine. Um, this was a number of years ago, every year in the United States, like around the world, they have a new vaccine, trying to guess which flu is coming out of China that year. And um, the vaccine disclosure in very tiny print on about the 14th page said that something like 20 or 25% that get the vaccine get the flu from the vaccine. And this flu, this COVID number 19 that we're all talking about is a really bad flu. So if taking the vaccine gives you a one in five chance of getting it, and then there's these other side effects in the first trial groups, you know, like your face is paralyzed or you have appendicitis or a heart attack, I'm thinking a lot of people are going to refuse it. And you told me that there's a debate now in Parliament that the vaccine can be mandated and if you don't get it, like bad things will happen to you and or you'll be denied services in the UK. Is that well, true? Yeah. 
Yes, absolutely. Thanks to, you know, we have these petitions that if they get over a certain number, there's a debate in Parliament. Thanks to 335,000 British people signing this petition, there is a debate in Parliament in a couple of days' time. And that debate is about, will the government start to do things to people if they refuse to have the vaccine? Will they take away our access to healthcare? Will they take away our access to schools? And of course, what we're hearing is those political phrases that you'll recognize, which are, there's no plans at present to introduce anything for people that, but no plans at present, of course, can change tomorrow. So we're watching that uh, debate. I've tried to get into the House of Commons to cover that in more detail for the ATP audience, and I have been prohibited from entering uh, the media uh, pack to be able to listen to that debate. They're not allowing anyone in. Now that's not surprising. Mm -hmm. So in London proper, I understand you're going into tier three, which is basically going to crush small businesses and the hospitality hotel industry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you guys know, you know, there's these crazy systems of lockdown. What stage of lockdown here? They're trying to put London into the, the deepest, hardest, most restrictive of lockdowns. And in order to do that, they've started mass testing of our children. So children age 11 and over are going to be tested in their schools. And you know why this happens, of course, it's because they will find those numbers and those numbers will be enough for them to say, well, look at the numbers in these young people. Now we need to lock everything down. No going out, no restaurants, no bars, no nothing. I mean, very much the California model. So we're going into an increased lockdown over Christmas. France just announced no going out for New Year's. And New Year's Eve in France, the City of Light, is a massive, massive event. I know New Year's is massive everywhere, but for Paris to already disclose that there's no New Year's, I think London actually are going to follow that and do exactly the same. But, Barry, as you know, at a local pub that won't be identified, there are still stories of hope and humanity that are carrying us through. Yeah, before we get to your pub story, which is kind of delightful, um, why is the UK testing kids? Uh, the statistics worldwide are that almost no children get it. And when I say almost no children, I mean one out of a couple hundred thousand. And those numbers then become literally borderline zero of the death rate of kids. They don't get the disease. And if they do get it, they don't even know they have it. And even if they have it, they don't die from it. So why are we testing kids? Yeah, and to me, it, it smacks of um, sort of mining. You know, if you were coal mining, and you wanted coal, you're gonna to go to the place you'll find coal. I think that's what they're doing now here. They're going to colleges to get these numbers. They need the numbers to be high. And so they're effectively mining places where they can achieve high numbers of COVID positive results, even though for the children involved, it has no impact, it has no effect on them, and there is no need at all to be shutting everything down. I suppose the broader question, Barry, is why? Why do they want London to collapse into a dark hole? You know, if I was going to be conspiratorial for a second to answer your question, I would simply say that when you create an unsolvable problem uh, and the government is the deliverer of the bad news, well, then people look to the government to solve their problem. And it becomes a demand on the governmental institutions to expand their footprint. And once expanded, governments never contract. Once they get their hooks into a policy, procedures, financing, administration, the deep state just grows. And it only goes in one direction, which is it gets bigger. Mm, absolutely. And you know, the other thing I've observed all over the world, I suppose now, is the very richest are isolated from the impact in the sense that typically they own their own homes. They're not going to be made homeless. They have a reserve of cash and they have stocks and shares or whatever. Whereas, of course, the individuals, just normal families are under threat of losing their homes because they lose their livelihood. And, and so there is that isolated bubble, aren't there, that are, 
aren't objecting to this because it's not really impacting them. I see them out in restaurants all the time. You know, the, you can see that this lockdown isn't really touching them. Oh, absolutely. It's do as I say, not as I do. And oh, mm -hmm. by the way, I hope the food delivery truck isn't late with my ice cream. Right. Uh, or <laughs> right. using the example of Nancy Pelosi. So <laughs> leave, us, leave us with a nice feel-good story. Yeah. Tell me about this pub that you've uh, heard about. I, I thought it was a delightful story. Go ahead. Uh -huh. And this is going to be my ATP aim, is that we always leave with some parable that is, you know, uplifting. Um, but I went to my local pub with my husband, and as the closing time was coming near, one by one, these elderly gentlemen came in with their little sticks and their little smart jackets and their masks. But they came in and they all sat around this large, if you imagine, an old, old British pub table that can seat at least 12. And they all took a chair and those chairs, it seemed, were known. Uh, and then they were just chatting and updating and you could see them were always excited to be there and to see each other. And it turns out they're elderly widowed gentlemen from this small village. They've been locked down, isolated and alone. And this delightful pub landlord that I know has told them that no one will touch them if they come to his pub and that they can sit there, have a drink or not, uh, be amongst each other and spend time and, and that no one will trouble them. And it's become like a sort of gathering of, you know, to me, that's the wisdom of a, of a village, a gathering of the elders. And I think, isn't that just a delight that amongst the rules and the nonsense, humanity prevails and that our elderly gentlemen are being treated in such a respectful manner by these beautiful people that I love. So, uh, you know, just was I was able to go up and just give them a big cheer um, to thank the pub landlord that I love. Um, and I just, I don't know, it makes me, I think these are the stories that, that make us certain that we will prevail through this. Well, that's a great story. I, I really appreciate you sharing it. And I'm going to have our national director, uh, Annie Cyrus, get an ATP mug that we can give to that Yay. pub uh, proprietor to celebrate the fact that he values freedom. Um, oh. And, and wants to protect the elderly. I really appreciate you sharing that story. Oh, thank you. Well, he said, actually, Barry, he came up when I was speaking to the gentleman and he said, I love your videos. So Barry, you and me were doing something right for him. I love to hear it. And the feedback <laughs> has made my morning. I appreciate <laughs> it. So thanks everybody for joining us. And thanks to Katie Hopkins for coming on again all the way from London, England. For those of you in the United States only that have not yet subscribed to our text message alert system, please take out your cell phones and text the message TRUTH, T-R-U-T-H, and send it to 88202, push send. You'll be automatically subscribed to our free text message alert system. And if you're around the world or an older fuddy-duddy like us <laughs> and you want to get your stuff uh, directly from the internet, go to americantruthproject.org and you can see us there and subscribe through the website or through Rumble or through uh, Parler or any one of our platforms. Thanks, Katie, for coming on today. Thank and, you. Uh, thanks to all our viewers out there. For ATP Report, I'm Barry Newsbaum.